Let's go ahead and open in prayer. We'll jump into eschatology. We'll hopefully have a good time. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, for your truth, for all you've done for us. It is truly an amazing blessing and honor to be able to be here with friends, with family members, with, with those of like mind and believers who want to understand who you are better, not only for who we are today, but also for what we will be, who you will be, and what your future holds. We look forward to that day. Help us to study well, to understand, and to grasp the concepts so that we will be able to explain who you are better to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Eschatology. Study of end times. We're dealing with lesson five, dealing with the Bema. The Bema is, they, people call it the Bema seat. They call it the judgment seat of Christ. It's kind of a little bit of a, of a added in interpretation. It's simply the word Bema. It's used all over scripture, dealing with simply just kind of like a decision seat. Uh, we're dealing with our eschatology timeline. We went over the current age. We are going to go over the rapture. We're skipping that for now. We will go over that in detail in November. But for now, we just kind of concluded that next up on our current timeline is the rapture. That's next. During this time, we're going to go, we've also gone over Israel a lot on Wednesday. So that's kind of a filler in. If you want to go over what's going on during the prelude or getting into the time after the rapture with Israel, that's Wednesday. Today, we're going to go over the Bema. When I return in two weeks, we will begin our expose of Jacob's trouble timeline, kind of getting more details, trying to line it up for you, what to know, what not to know. And we'll be understand that. And then, of course, we'll go from there to return with Christ. That'd be us returning with Christ. And then the judgments of the Messiah. It does go back into it a little bit, but dealings primarily with what happens when Christ returns and how he judges both the living and the dead. And we'll talk about the living and the dead. We might talk a little bit about today. Rule and reign, kingdom established. As you can see, our timeline meshes with Israel's timeline as we get to the end. And then the thousand year reign, and then obviously we get into the eternal age. The doctrine of rewards is essential because we need to understand it and uh, and kind of contrast to salvation. Salvation and rewards are not the same thing. If you understand rewards, you'll understand what God evaluates in accordance with our activity. What do we do? How do we do our, how do you know, do we do everything in accordance to his word or are we rebellious? So rewards are in conjunction with who we are as believers, but rewards are not heaven and hell. Heaven and hell is determined by whether you believe or not. Heaven is a free gift by grace. Rewards is something that is will be given out to individuals, to believers at the end in our recognition of service. So a believer's service is subject not to condemnation. A believer's service, let's say you're the worst Christian ever. Will you be punished by Jesus Christ when you see him at this throne? No. Why? Why? Sins are sins are forgiven. Who paid for them? Christ. So like, what? What? So now you have to pay for some. So basically, what you're saying is, if you say that you have to be punished for sins, then what you're saying is the cross of Christ was insufficient to pay for those sins. Rather, it is subject to rewards. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 10, we're going to read this now. We'll come back to it a little bit later, just kind of getting an idea of it, because I want to explain the, the, good and, the good and bad. It says, therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We understand truth, not by what we see in front of our noses. We are, a good, we are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be home with the Lord. Therefore... We also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. Why? For we must all appear before the Bema of Christ. Judgment seat, Bema. 
so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. We'll come back to that momentarily. It is definitive. It is a, an absolute declaration that all believers must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. When does that happen? Undetermined. Does it happen the moment that we would pass away and we go in the spirit before the Lord? Is that when we it happens for, for us now? Does it happen immediately at the rapture? Does it take seven years? Uh, we have no idea. Okay. I, I don't like to put any type of like, you know, timelines on that when the Bible does not give us timelines. Have those who have already been uh, up front with Jesus Christ already been appeared before the judgment seat? Perhaps. Or are they going to wait? Perhaps. Don't know. Is it, is, it, is it that important? Probably not. This judgment seat is also understood, or Bema, again, this is an evaluation of believers, is also found in Romans chapter 14, verse 10. But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you, again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we all stand before the Bema of God. Still, it's an evaluation. So it's not determining whether or not we are saved or unsaved. This is a, an evaluation of our lives as believers. Romans, uh, sorry, uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 27, repeats something that is used throughout Scripture. For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. Now, this is a little bit um, out of context. I think this has a uh, both a, a, a within the context point, but there's also something that is perpetual, understood. That God is a rewarder. He comes with recompense. Now, to those who are on earth, it's a different type of recompense. Be careful. But we also see that in Acts chapter 10, verse 42, because Jesus Christ is the one who will be doing the evaluation. It's not you and I. It's not like, you know, it's a committee. It's Jesus Christ. He is the one who is the judge of the living and the dead. By the way, who is the living and who is the dead? Believers and unbelievers, just to give you a quick understanding. In Hebrews in Hebrews eleven six, it says we without faith it is impossible to please him. For those who come to God must come believing that he is a rewarder of those who eagerly seek him. That's that's a different word than gift. It's a different word than the salvation offer. Salvation is a free gift given to those who believe. Reward is something that is a, that is given out. For service, for for other inclusions, the bema, according to what we have seen, this judgment seat, I believe, is in the spiritual realm and raises neither the question of whether the believer shall enter heaven nor whether he shall remain in heaven. That's not what the bema is for. Where do, so we're looking at these verses, understanding what we're what we're trying to grasp here, and and see that yes. Each of us as believers, it's not like we just die and go to heaven. And yeah, everything's done. There's an evaluation period. Now, that should give you some type of encouragement. Why? Because it's talked about on a regular basis. Probably the most definitive section on this is 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 9 through 15. If you will, go ahead and turn there. I'll give you a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 9 through 13. And we'll also kind of skip ahead to chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. By the way, if you ever have twinnings, lemon ginger, herbal tea is fantastic. I've been talking about it for a while. I think I should get my stock in twinnings, promoting it for free online. What I'm going to have this little includes page subscription, you know. First Corinthians chapter three, verse nine. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building, according to the grace of God, which is given to me. Like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. For each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, if any man builds on that foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident, 
for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire and the fire itself will test the what quality quality of each man's work if any man's work which he has built on it remains he will receive a reward if any man's work is burned up he will suffer loss but he himself will be saved yet as through fire now don't one day i'll get here and i'll teach this fully so you don't get all confused i'll just go ahead and give you the summary okay god's testing the quality of a work it is not testing whether or not you're saved or not it's costing the quality it is not a measure of whether or not you go to hell and don't look at the fire as you know what you got to go to purgatory this is one of the purgatory pastors by the way it's not what i was talking about it's like you're in there burning it up you have to actually deal with god and he is going to test your work not you in first corinthians chapter 4 verses 1 through 5 it says let a man regard us in this manner as servants of christ and stewards of the mysteries of god in this case moreover it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy but to me it's a very small thing that i may be examined by you can you imagine if i said that to you by the way bert it's a small thing it's a small thing that i've been examined by you sounds kind of arrogant doesn't it why or by any human court i in fact what does paul say i don't even examine myself i can't why I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am, but, but I am not acquitted by this. But the one who examines me is the Lord. Can you imagine? You're like, oh, I, I think I'm okay, but I don't know. God's going to determine. And how does he determine it? Verse 5. Do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. Okay, let's go into some, let's go into some explanation here. So in this passage, the principle for evaluation is set. The believer who is once for all established on the foundation Jesus Christ, he's the one, the foundation, you're a believer, you're set. It's said to be building either with materials that are subject to, to burning by fire or refined by fire. This passage is about those who build upon the foundation. So it has a direct application to those in ministry. You're building on a foundation in a particular area. How do you build upon that? Do you build it well, on it with gold, precious stones, and you know, and, and silver, or do you build on it with some hay? Now we look at that and we see the determination. And what do our minds automatically think? We think good works and sin. Oh, I'm I'm building hay. That's sin. It doesn't say sin. That's easy to evaluate. We we can evaluate that. Someone comes and tries to build up on here and say, you know what I think we ought to do? I think we ought to start doing some type of smuggling ring, bringing in, you know, stolen goods. We're not going to go, huh, that would bring in a lot of money. You know, maybe we could repaint something. We would obviously see that and go, that, that, that's, not, that's not good. That's sin. We can evaluate that. Okay. We're looking at it from we're looking at it from our perspective. He says, I don't evaluate myself, which means what? I think what I'm doing is good, but I don't know. So secondary application is about um, the evident uh, is, is also evident, the principle of works being tested. All believers will have their building materials examined. The building material again is not good works and bad works, rather, it is both material seems to have worth in human evaluation. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to somebody and said, oh, that church is such a good church. I go, why do you say so? Well, they they have a soup kitchen. That, sound, that sounds like a good work, right? I go, how's their doctrine? Well, it's not that good. But they have a soup kitchen. Like, do you think that that is going to be worthy? What is their evaluation? God will test them with fire. The quality will reveal itself. The quality is based upon, according to chapter 4, 
not based upon the person's actual what we evaluate, but whether or not God deems it as good. His evaluation, not ours. Suffering loss in this context is not punitive. The one being evaluated believed he did good, great and rewardable work. But then he has nothing left after the test of the quality. I'll be honest with you, it's my biggest fear. I, I try to check my motives. Why am I doing what am I doing? And there are times, I have told, I've said this before, there are times I have stood up here, given a lesson, did all my preparation. Why? Because it's my job. Guess what? I have my reward. I got a paycheck. But why am I doing it? Am I doing other things out of selfish ambition, trying maybe if I'm really nice to that guy, maybe he'll give me an extra hundred dollars. Maybe I'll get a gift. If I'm doing it for those reasons, guess what? I have my reward. No matter what you think the quality of the work is, God determines the quality based upon why, why I'm doing it. Not just what it's being done. The quality is evaluated by revealing of the hidden things, the motivation of each one's work. This brings us to 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 10 again, because I want to make sure we understand what it means by good and bad. Therefore, being of good courage and knowing that while we are home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. We walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and I and pref rather prefer to be absent from the body, to be home with the Lord. Therefore, we have our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. The word pleasing, sometimes translated acceptable, to be to, to understand exactly what he wants and to perform what he desires, sometimes even sacrificing our own. Why? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of God, of Christ, Bema, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, According to what he has done, according, remember we have to go back to 1 Corinthians 4 and also test it with, with motives, whether good or bad. The word good here in this text is the word agathos. Agathos is a word that means good as determined by God. It's not how we determine good, right? We may think something's good and God goes, that's not my good, it's your good. We have another word for basically advantageous or, or beneficial and that is the word kalos. So we could say kalos here and say, well, whatever is really kind of beneficial in the area, we'd have a lot less of a standard to hold. But no, we have the word agathos, good as determined by God. The word bad is the word phalos. Phalos. The word does not mean sin, but rather works that are low grade or substandard. If you're a contractor, you understand what I'm talking about. We have a building here. I go, this. if you ever looked at the guts of this building? I mean, I, I appreciate all the founders of this church. Man, they put together a good building. It is concrete and steel all the way up, all the way across. Underneath this floor is not wood. It is concrete and steel. How do I know that? Because I try to drill a hole through it. Try to put some more wires and like that's metal. Who put some? Nobody builds like that. What do they build it out of? The cheapest plywood you could find. And what happens if there's a little bit of a spark? It's gone. You see houses. Uh, a friend of mine had his under during a hurricane had his whole house moved off the foundation. I thought it's supposed to be attached. Faulty. It looks good, but the actual work is substandard. So this would probably be translated better as inferior in quality or worthless, base, or paltry. So if your works, all the things you think you're doing are good, but it's, 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 in God's evaluation, it's substandard. Less of a reward or no reward. The evaluation is unrelated to the problem of sin. Now, let's be honest. Somebody who's living a life of sin, somebody who is living for self, somebody who is 
overtly in rebellion against God, how many good things are they going to put forward with a proper motivation? I, I'm not the evaluator. They're not the evaluator. God's the evaluator. But my suspicion is suspicion. If at all. Right? Why? Because their constant motivation is self-indulgence, hedonism, looking out for self. Why? Because you can't live in rebellion to God and be thinking about him. You can't live in rebellion with God and be thinking about your fellow man and loving them. So you're violating the two things, love God and love people. Valuation is probably going to be pretty low. But this is a rewards evaluation, not a punitive judgment. The believer is not judged. How do I know that? There's some verses for that. John chapter 3, verses 17 to 18. For God did not send his world into the world to judge the world, but the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not, what? Judged. And it's, no, notice it's not will not be judged. It's not like, hey, maybe he won't, is not judged. These are definitive statements. He who does not believe, so what's the evaluation? Good works, bad works? No. It's not an evaluation of works. It's an evaluation of what? Whether or not you have believed. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has done some pretty bad works. No, because he has not believed the offer, who he is, what he has done, and what he offers. You don't believe that. If you don't believe it, then you're judged. John 5, 24 Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment. He has passed out of death into life. It is in life that you are evaluated. It is not to determine whether or not you are in life or death. Well, that's good, Will. Now I know that I am going to be rewarded or not rewarded. So what do I get? Is that a proper question? What's in it for me? Absolutely, it's a proper question. How do I know that? Because Jesus was asked this question and he responded to his disciples. Don't worry. Whatever you give to me in this life, I will give more. Whatever you dedicate to me in this life, you will have more. So we have to ask the question, what's on the table, right? The most often used idea in regard to reward is the idea of crowns. But, but I do not believe this to be exclusive. In other words, the only thing on the table is not crowns. However, that's what we have the most information upon. Here's what I do know. That whatever we put forward in service to God with proper motivation will not will not be more than what we see in glory. It's not like we're going to go up there and go, that's it? No. How do I know that? Romans chapter 8, verse 18, gives us a glimpse into glory. For I consider the sufferings of this present time. You think... If you think you had a rough life, and I know a lot of people have, a lot of suffering, a lot of afflictions, a lot of things that you can't control that is painful, no matter, even if our perspective is, is, is not incorrect, and we just, you know, we just had a rough life. Perhaps your parents are bad, right, Leanna? The worst. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared. It doesn't say they'll outweigh them. It doesn't say, eh, it'd be a little bit more. Are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So regardless of what we think the reward is or may be, we have to understand and get it through our think skull that God will take care of it. There's nothing that we can do on this earth that cannot be given more than we can ever anticipate from God. 
but there are crowns. So whether it's going to be something else, some type of, I don't know what they are, but crowns are one of the most, one, uh, most definitive, easily understandable concepts. First and foremost, there's the crown of righteousness. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now, I wasn't, I keep on de and deciding and never decide something like, and then change your mind. Let's, let's get a little bit context. So I'll look at verse six first. Paul is basically his swan song. This is his last words given to Timothy. We believe that this is the last letter written. By Paul. He talks about his immediate demise. He's about ready to die. I believe he's in prison. I believe he's probably already gotten the certificate of death. And he's probably going, you know what? Let me go ahead and give Timothy a, 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 a few more words just in case that, that death sentence comes tomorrow. He says, verse 6, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. I remember Sarah and I, when we were younger, going, how do we get there? How do we have that kind of confidence? How do we, how do we, how can we say, I know my reward is coming? Well, number one, you have to live your life. What does it say there? It's a longevity reward. It's finishing the course. It's ending to the end, loving God, loving Jesus Christ to the end. To the ones who have loved his appearing is, you know, people have kind of questioned about that. I think it's actually kind of simple. I believe it is definitely the concept of individuals who at the appearing of Jesus Christ would go, yay. Yay. You know, um, as believer, have you been ever like doing something and going, I really hope you didn't come back right now. Do you ever feel like that situation where if he came back right now, I'd be like, eh, just, just give me one second. One second, let me clean this up real quick, right? Or do you see Jesus Christ coming in the clouds? You go, yes, thank you. And I'm running to him. I love that appearing. It's kind of like, you know, if your parents ever leave for a weekend and then they come back and you're like, I didn't do the dishes. No, like that. Oh, yeah, I'm going to take this out of the freezer. Yeah, like, wait, wait, uh, can you come back in an hour? I'll defrost it real quick. And sometimes you see your parents and you're like, you'd love to see him again. You've missed them. I haven't eaten well. All I had was ho-hos. No one's cooking for me. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 through 39, it says this. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence. Confidence is this concept of an absolute assurance of what's coming, which has a great reward. For you had need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised for yet no very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but to those who have faith to preserving of the soul. So are you ones who are living by faith, living by the doctrines of God that he has set forth and not by the circumstances of his life, but you go, I know who God is. I know where my future lies and I am living confidently in that path. Or are you living for the world and the world system and the world's legacy, the world's riches? And when you see God, are you going to go, I haven't done everything I'm supposed to do? Are you shrinking back or are you running to him? That's the question. First John chapter 2, verse 28. 
Now, little children, abide in him. Here's the method right here. How do you get to that point? Abide in Christ. How many times? Abide means perpetual. Remain in Christ. Remain there. So that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. When he appears, when we stand there, do we have the assurance that we've been doing what we're supposed to be doing? Again, this is not an evaluation of heaven or hell. This is not like, oh, I might go to hell now. No, it's, no, that's not the question. The question is, do we have confidence in seeing him, looking upon him as if we are ex expecting and wanting his return, loving his appearing? It's a longevity reward. So that's the crown of righteousness. Next up is the crown of life. Crown of life, according to James chapter 1, verse 12, is a, uh, an endure, basically it's endurance under, and I don't call it trials, under temptation. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. That word trial is the word temptation. It's a bad translation. Trial is not the right aspect because trial, we put everything in a trial. You get, you're, on your, you're on your way to work in a flat tire. Oh, this trial. Are you going to preserve? That's, that's not the question. It's a temptation. What's the temptation? Each man is tempted by his own heart, according to James chapter 2. You can't say I'm tempted by God. I'm tempted by my own persuasion, my own lust. Some things you might be persuaded by, other things I'm not. But if you persevere, that's hubomone, remain under and remain under with a positive outcome, under temptation, okay, you're going to preserve that. For once he has been approved, you kind of like demonstrate that perseverance under that temptation perpetually, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord promised to those who love him. Here's again, I've got to love him again. Why? What does loving Christ mean? That you desire what he desires. Your mind is his mind. It is the mental attitude of Christ, Philippians chapter 2. In Revelation chapter 2, it gets more specific. Still the crown of life. I know your tribulation. Tribulation is the word thelipsis. It is the word pressure. It's a pressure. It's a, something that causes you to try to fall or, or be assuaged from, from doing the right thing. I know your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy by those who say that are Jews are not. But are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Notice he doesn't say, don't worry, I'm not going to let you suffer. That's not the promise of God during this time. The devil's about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. Okay? So crown of life seems to be remain under this pressure, under this world. Be faithful until death. Do not give up your confidence of who God is. Understand what his purpose is. Understand his eternality. Do that, and you receive this crown. Does it say that if you, that if you give up, you're going to go to hell? No, because that's not the question. The question is your evaluation as a believer. Thirdly, there's a crown of glory. Now, this one's specific, all right? Um, turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. I will pick up, I will begin reading in verse 1. The main verse is going to be verse 4. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you, as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion. By the way, I believe doing it for a paycheck is under compulsion. That's why I'm like, ah, check my motives all the time, right? But voluntarily, according to the will of God and not for sordid gain, mm. uh, but with eagerness, not yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge. You're not authoritative. You're, you don't, elders don't have any authority. 
They're simply there to help and to serve the spiritual needs of the people who are here within the, the local body. But proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, all that's been done, you'll receive the unfading and unfading crown of glory. Given to those who are leaders, who are shepherds for good and proper and faithful service, protecting, feeding, and being an example to and for the flock. Now, the difficulty in this is, ask it, are these the only reward? And again, I don't think so. I think these are some of the specifics that you can get into. But do I think there's only one? Personal is a quiet life. And again, I think that the, the crown of righteousness, I think, is something... In the crown of life, I think there's something that are actually easy to obtain as long as we maintain a biblical worldview. We have not suffered like a lot of the places in the world have suffered. Do I think it's coming eventually? I think persecution and pressure and, you know, and being literally persecuted socially, criminally, physically. I think it's coming. When? I have no idea. It's been kind of on the outskirts at different times. So crown of righteousness and crown of life, persevering through those circumstances are huge. But I do think that there are all times living a quiet life, serving your family, doing good works according to scripture. And when he sees you, you see him, there'll be a reward. But what do these crowns indicate specifically? Well, um, there, there have been debates, okay? Some think that this is the crowns that are given back in, Rome, in Revelation 4.10. I don't think so. I think it's a stretch that, uh, that we're all going to have crowns and we're going to throw them at Jesus' feet. Therefore, uh, one person says uh, our reward is, is an ability to give back to God something beautiful that he deems worthy. I'm, I'm not going to say no, but I think it's a stretch. Crowns are often used to demonstrate authority. I think we see this before, right? In the millennial reign, there appears to be authority given to faithful service. So my theory on crowns and rewards are in the millennial kingdom, in the millennial reign, the thousand-year reign of Christ, there's an authority to the faithful who serve in this life. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, 11 through 13, it talks about endurance. It's a trustworthy statement. For if we die with him, we'll live with him. If we endure... We will reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. What will he deny us? Well, endurance is, is in opposition to deny. There's a potential. There's a lack of reigning. There's a thing. That you could have had more. Okay? By the way, at the end, if we, are, if we do not believe, he remains faithful. If we, believers, stop believing, he remains faithful. Now, I think, obviously, we lose a little bit of that endurance. In Revelation chapter 2, 25 to 29, here's an interesting passage, all right? Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. He who overcomes, the overcomer is basically one who believes in Jesus, and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces. And I also have received authority from my father and will give him the morning star. There seems to be a second level of authority given other than the inheritance we will receive as a guarantee. When we get to the kingdom with Christ, there is an inheritance we will have. I don't know what the base level is. There's a base level. But then there are things that we can acquire on top of that. To what extent? Authority. I had somebody goes, I don't care about authority. I understand that. I'm not qualified. You will be. I don't know how. You'll be trained. Don't worry. Christ will take care of it all. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, I don't know if this is a part of the inheritance or as part of the reward system. I just find it interesting. Does any one of you, when he has a case before his, against his neighbor, neighbor basically be believer against believer, dare before go to the law of the unrighteous and not before the saints? You have a conflict with one another, a, a financial dispute. Why not just take it to your elders? That's what it's saying here. But instead, you're suing one another. Do you not know the saints will judge the world? The word judge is have authority over. 
if the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? In other words, get practicing. Do you not know that we will judge angels? Hmm? Why? Because man, even though he was made a little, a little bit lower than the angels, is actually destined to be the rulers of creation. Hmm. My final point on the Bema, he's going to come down, he's going to look at your life, and he's going to evaluate what you've done, good or worthless. The rewards are on the table. I don't know all of them, and I think there's more than what we can determine in God. I think there's mysteries there. Leave God with his mysteries. But there are things in which he will determine for us and our reward. Crowns or other things. Authorities or something else. I believe that these are primarily in effect. These rewards are primarily in effect in the millennial kingdom. Some of them may go into the eternal age rewards as well. I don't know when it comes down to that question, whether or not they're millennial kingdom only or all the way through the eternal age. I'm a pantheist. I believe that God will have it all pan out in the end. But I do believe that ruling and reigning seems to be the primarily an effect during the thousand year reign of Christ. I, I don't know, and I'm going to leave it to God to figure it all out. However, even if the reward only lasts a thousand years, that's it. Is it worth your attention to serve God for 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 80 years? Is it worth it? The compound interest on that is huge. Understand what God offers as of to believers to do what is right according to his will. And God will reward you. And it will be greater than anything we can imagine. Let's pray. God in heaven, thank you for your word, for your truth, for all that you've done for us. The, the study of rewards is truly fascinating. You promise us great things. We already have the best thing, and that is eternal life as a free gift. But still, you want to give us more. Help us to understand who you are, what you promise, so that we can function appropriately. And in the end, be happy to see you. Help us all to be there. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.